welcome to the Journey of an Aesthete podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. How are you doing? This is Laurie. Uh, we're speaking with Laurie Jill Strickland. Uh, this is uh, Mitch Hampton, and this is Jerdy Evanesthi. And this, you might call this our special holiday episode. Holiday episode, a Christmas episode. Um, and so that's what that's the occasion. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about about you. Uh, to the audience because I don't believe you've met. Um, so you, Laurie Jill Strickland, among other things, she's the producer of our podcast, of our show. So if I may speak about her, even though she's here, um, she's really responsible um, in great part for a lot of what you experience when you listen to this show um, in terms of uh, all sorts of logistics and planning and uh, intuition, uh, but Laurie, Laurie's, of course, is m- much more than that. Um, she is an accomplished uh, actress. She is a voice artist. Uh, has done numerous, uh, numerous programs, both commercial and otherwise, u- utilizing her voice. She's a dramaturg. She's uh, a writer. Uh, she's written film scripts. I may be leaving some things out here. Um, <laughs> she, she, uh, she, so she's an actor, a producer, a writer. Um, and I believe once upon a time you were a woodwind player as well. <laughs> um, and you have been in, you have been done television and movies. Um, you've done a lot of theater. You actually got to perform under Edward Albee. Um, but most importantly, probably today, as this is, uh, uh, this is December, what is it, 16th, mm-hmm. December 16th, um, you are a Dickensian, right? Would that be, would that be fair to say that? You are a Charles Dickens aficionado and scholar, and this is the first year in a, quite a while that you have not been actively in production on Christmas Carol. So Laurie Jill Strickler is someone that has been producing the show Christmas Carol yearly at this time, this time of year. Uh, for how many years would you say you had done that? 
Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And yeah. very honored that I get to be a producer on, on this podcast. So extra special. Um, yes, it, we, I began that project in December of 2011. I actually put pen to paper on the adaptation with some other artistic collaborators uh, winter of that year, so like let's say October. But the idea had been in my mind and heart for about 10 years prior, and I had talked myself out of it for a while. And that mm-hmm. year, the uh, match struck and we did it. <laughs> so 2011 to now, eight, eight years solid putting it up. Mm-hmm the world actually so this is an interesting year for me that makes this episode extra special because I I get to uh, investigate with you something that I love very much yeah well that's the reason why I wanted to do it in fact I called you up and said you know you're not doing a Christmas carol we have to do a holiday episode on Journey of <laughs> the um, but you know it's interesting when I was growing up in the 70s 70s and 80s um, a lot of um Th- things that had continuity mm-hmm. would always have a holiday episode, like TV shows, especially. Like I would watch the White Shadow Christmas episode. I'd watch the Eight Is Enough <laughs> Christmas episode. Walton's these television, very commercial television shows, would do very contrived. I might add, um, I say contrived it, but not more in a descriptive than a than a than an evaluative sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would do these contrived shows to sort of be topical about that time period. Um, and they would find, you know, sometimes they would have better stories or worse stories or clever stories that have to do with the meaning of what used to be called Christmas. Of course, now it's complicated, as you know, mm-hmm. because Christmas is, is – people try to politicize it and make it, um, mm-hmm. make it into, uh, into something that's, that's narrow – about one particular religion and one particular denomination. They're part of the world. And um, I guess you might say I think that's unfortunate because you're, uh, I believe your work with the Christmas Carol, uh, sole purpose was, was, was the opposite of all that, was to, yeah. try, to try to take seriously Christmas as, as a universal ritual or at least a ritual with universal potential Mm-hmm. about what the message of, of Christmas is. And, of course, you know, I have to say that everybody has their own experience of the holidays and Christmas. I mean, I know as, as, I, as we speak now, I see these ads. Um, uh, if, you, if you a loved one is suffering depression or anxiety um, mm-hmm. over the holidays, over Christmas, you know, contact this phone number. Or, you know, somebody you know might not be telling you, but they may be depressed because they may, may be alone. Mm. It's interesting. I see these ads all the time. I'm sure you do too. They pop up on the internet. Um, it, it's interesting because uh, if Christmas or the holidays are going to have a point, I think the point has to be the opposite of depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. loneliness, mental difficulty because mm-hmm. of what the message is. So I thought it would be nice to do a, you might call it a, a holiday episode. And I mm-hmm. thought it might be nice to actually have you talk about, well, if you wanted to, talk about your perspective on Charles Dickens and doing that show and, and the unique, um, I must say your, your interpretation is completely unique. Uh, there's nothing else out there like it. But I, but I also have to say that it's actually truest to the spirit of what Dickens' sto- novels, truest to the, to the work, right? You went back to the text and you got away from all the, you know, the kind of the, I guess you might say, um, uh, many, many years of uh, yeah. misinterpretations or or um, stuff that's uh, grown up around it, weeds that have grown up around it. <laughs> you try to get back to the essence of a Christmas carol. But, you know, that, I don't know what we tackle first. I mean, there's so much that we could talk yeah. about. We could talk about acting. We could talk about Christmas. We could talk about your biography in Christmas. Um we could talk about Austin Pendleton. We could, you know, a lot of people listening might not know what a dramaturg does. It's very important. You could talk mm. about that, but it's, I'll leave that up to you. If you, you know, whatever comes to your mind first or. Well, thank you for that. I mean, what a, what an abundance of riches really to explore here. And I'm so privileged that, uh, again, 
you know, to be on your show as, as a guest, which is so, so uh, fascinating, really, since I'm usually on the other side mm-hmm. of that storytelling. But it's extra special to me because, of course, I do love A Christmas Carol and, and I do have been spending a lot of time uh, on Charles Dickens' works and just Charles Dickens in general and particularly that novella. Um, so I'm happy to investigate all of it. I think it, as mo- many things you and I discuss both on air and off from time to time, you know, everything's connected. So I see the dramaturgical work and other other things you mentioned is all connected somehow in the ethers of this. Um, you know, I, I don't know what's easier for you if you want me to go in your linear chronology. I know you love doing that. I'm happy to jump in anywhere. But I, I, I am thoughtful because of your opening remarks about this time of year and what some people experience during this time of year, which, you know, is can be very difficult and a very beautiful and, you know, so many adjectives we could get into about this time of year. Yeah. But one of the real driving forces of this, and there's a pretty deep story, backstory to that, but just for now, was this idea that I really wanted to do a production of Christmas Carol where everyone felt welcome, no matter what they celebrated during this time of year, not even just specifically Christmas. Mm-hmm. And the last, the last word of Charles Dickens' novella is the teacher, has been the teacher to me, because over time the title of this production changed to everyone's Carol. The last line of A Christmas Carol is Tiny Tim's um, God blesses everyone. Mm. And over time, that the word everyone became really the compass for the way that, you know, we do this production in particular. I mean, there's so many beautiful productions of Christmas Carol all over the world mm. in different languages and cultures. Everywhere right now, if we, like, Google Live, you know, Christmas Carol Productions Global, we would just see endless pages of them right now in this, this current season. So, you know, it's it's always that question when you're going to adapt a great work, you know, what is it that, why do we need another one, and what is it that I have to offer this, or is there, are there important questions to ask yourself when you're dealing with something that's basically mythology, which A Christmas Carol is, in terms of its place in literature and dramatic literature, and I think also spiritually, I mean, that it's just a, it's a title and it's a story that embody so much for so many and interestingly enough crosses cultures and even crosses you know i mean it even unifies different religions because in in essence that's what dickens is working with and that is so universal and i really love how you open this by bringing up what people go through at this time of year because every every single thing you describe is scrooge's state of mind at the beginning of this of the story Mm -hmm. There are pages and pages dedicated to him walking through the streets of London alone, you know, his gloomy suite of rooms, you know, it's everything you're talking about really is the pressure cooker that we find at the beginning of that story that brings this particular night to life. It, it, you know, everything you're describing. So it's fascinating mm-hmm. to me that in 1843 Dickens could could capture in these pages both the pathos and the beauty and, you know, the joy of the holiday season and the extreme loneliness and, you know, people taking stock and the turn of the year and, you know, there's just so much in the story. But everything that's in that story is also described in the few sentences you started this episode with. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons that I was really excited you wanted to do a holiday episode is I was thinking of our listeners, and I was thinking, you know, we don't really know. I mean, we don't really know what people might be going through this time of year or celebrating this time of year mm-hmm. or whatever their beliefs are or not. But at the end of the day, just saying, hey, you know, we can gather around this time of year around storytelling in general, which a podcast is, storytelling. So I love the idea that anyone listening to this episode, you know, might – might find some uh, find that space just like we try to do with the show with everyone's carol that they can connect around this time of year. So, um, but I'm happy to jump into any thread of this tapestry. <laughs> Anywhere you want to start. Well, we I think we're off to a really good start. Um, I, I I appreciate what you're saying. So I think one of the things you're saying is that there are things inside this this text, mm-hmm. Christmas Carol, that you 
we're inspired by. And in turn, you said, well, I want to do something about this or with this mm -hmm. um, because uh, there's something here for people. And you, and you say there's something here for the world. Now, that, that's very important. So Dickens, it's interesting, Dickens is an author. Um, his, his interest is um, not in one particular group of people. Mm -hmm. His interest is not in just in, in the British or, you know, the people of 1843. Um, but his interest is literally something we might call more universal, correct? Oh, and, yes. And, and, mm -hmm. that, and that's why you, you named your production Everyone's Carol. And I find that quite beautiful. I find that really beautiful and very, um, very to, to, to the degree to which there is a spirit of Christmas. Um, I think that is the spirit of Christmas. It, it's something that's above and beyond people wanting to put it in a box, right? Mm -hmm. um, a box only for Christians or, or, you know, or even Jews or Muslims. In other words, a box that, you know, this is Christmas it means such and such. Um, that's alienated a lot of people. Um, that that the fact that people people have done that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's there's a, there's a, there's a truer spirit of of, the, of this time of year um, that Dickens was trying to express. Um, but to get to linear chronology, I'm interested in the transformation from idea to show. I find that absolutely fascinating because you have one of these great actors, uh, Austin Pendleton doing Scrooge, mm -hmm. and you've traveled to London and you've gotten to know the Dickens people in London. Do you mind mm -hmm. tracing that that story of, of the inception of how this came to be and how the, this um, – it's a fascinating yeah. story. It's fascinating to me too. If you had told me when all this began, the journey that I would have right up until now with you here on Journey of an Estate, yeah. I would I would be I would be like this must be in a fairy tale book somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, part of what I do in in uh, many show creators or showrunners on television, or you might say a producer in the film world or theater. I mean, what a lot of people do who conceive shows. Mm -hmm. It calls on all the skills you mentioned in the beginning of this. You know, a lot of show creators are also writers and actors. And mm -hmm. you wear a lot of hats when you're conceiving something kind of 360, really, you know, or developing a story into production. Even your podcast is that, too, yeah. you know. So with everyone's Carol, the to go back to the beginning would really be to go way back and say that I now can look back and see that there was this thread with the holidays and Christmas for me all the way back to – first grade when I was cast as Tommy the cat who saves Christmas and wakes up Santa Claus who's fallen asleep. I can look, I remember my lines from that and I yeah. maybe I was barely six and I'm thinking, I didn't see it now. I see it now. Of course along the way I didn't see these connections. Yeah. But I also, you know, creating this Christmas book in middle school, you had to create a book of original poems and images and it was had to be Christmas themed and Somehow that year, with all these wonderful students, I won this Christmas contest with this book I made, this original book. But again, these are things that I only now, sitting here with you, can look back and say, wow, this began way before Dickens and Christmas Carol. There was something about that time of year. And then my own journey, both for the joy and the pathos, I've, I've known it all, which maybe uniquely qualified me to follow Suja's story in this about what it's like to be on the inside of that time of year and what it's like to feel on the outside of that time of year. But all along, this idea of telling stories around it always was a part of my life that I now can see. You know, sometimes you can look, you know, put the glasses on and say hindsight's twenty twenty. But but to move forward to Dickens, I was in graduate school. I was very fortunate to be at the National Theater Conservatory oh, at the wow. Denver Center Theater Company. And they have, as many regional theaters Many theaters all over the world have a beautiful production of Christmas Carol, and I was fortunate to be cast in it. And Laird Williamson was the director, and he had his own adaptation he had done that was very elegant mm -hmm. and gorgeous. And I would say traditional, I mean, he's an innovative storyteller, but traditional in the sense that high production values, gorgeous costumes, I mean. And, but here's the thing that I remember from that time. Mm -hmm. 
the artistic director of the Denver Theater Company at that time, Donovan Marley, and that theater has won Tony Awards for Best Regional Theater. I mean, yep. it, it, I mean, we talk about the theater history that's come even from that time at the Denver Center. It's pretty extraordinary. And I remember being a first-year grad student, and it was summer. And there were people lined up around the block, double lined up to get the study guide for Christmas Carol. Now, this is summer. They can't see it until November, you know, late November. But there were children with their parents. I mean, the study guides they created, speaking of dramaturgy, were unbelievable. I mean, it it didn't matter if you were an actor or director or whatever you were going to be. I mean, doing your research for that role or for that play, that's like, that's what I was brought up doing, both as an actor Uh and a writer and a director. I mean, before grad school even, that was always the way I was trained as an actor, but more on that later. So back to the linear chronology. I remember so clearly seeing that line. At the time, I didn't know I was going to want to, I wasn't fully realizing that my true passion would be creating shows or writing or directing and producing or basically in a way a form of an artistic director. You know, I didn't know that, but at the time I remember this feeling of watching what Donovan had built in his audience that they would take it so seriously to come get a study guide for Christmas Carol. And then fast forward, that show, that theater sat over 400 people. There were many main stages at that theater. He built it. It basically was built on the idea that the National Theatre in London has, which is that you have more than one main stage, and you have your you have your experimental plays and your new plays, but you also have your Christmas carols and your you know it had four different spaces so that different works could be nurtured. And I remember, do you, do you mind if I say something? Hold that thought. I, I was thinking they should have that with every art. Oh, they should sure. do that with with classical music, jazz music. Uh, in other words, it's it's uh, it, we have that for theater, but it'd be wouldn't it be great if they had like a multiple, if there was a anyhow. I don't mean I don't mean to go off on a no, tangent. Please, but. I can I can I can talk about this with you all day long. I mean, yeah. you know, and I will. I this has everything to do with the chronology. I'll try to yeah. skip over some details and just say that. But I remember Donovan always giving these company talks, and he said to us, and you know, remember, I'm a first year grad student. It's a, an amazing opportunity that I'm in this conservatory, which at the time, the National Theater Conservatory, really special place. They only take eight actors a year. It's it's very specialized conservatory. And he said to us and to the whole company, the whole company meaning all the actors that were guest artists and the, the you know year-round company members and the artisans and everybody, that we are not, this is not just our cash cow. I mean, I, I'm not quoting him word for word. But in general, we're not just phoning in a Christmas carol because we know it's our cash cow for the year. We're going we're going to make a beautiful Christmas carol. And with someone like Laird Williamson, of course it was going to be well done and beautifully articulated. And so I was so privileged as a student to be in this gorgeous production. And that said, you know, I've always been a writer, so I would be on stage, and at that time, even though I love classical literature and came up in two classical theater companies, and I was obsessed, if I could have only done the classics, that's all I would have signed up for the rest of my life, oh. somehow Dickens and I had not spent a lot of time together yet, so I, until I was doing my research, you know, as a, as a good actor should, you know, I actually really hadn't delved into Dickens, somehow in school, it didn't it just wasn't, it was more Shakespeare. And mm-hmm. so when I was, I say all this to say that, first of all, when you play to a sold out audience that's at least over 400 people every night for yeah. months, I mean, that does some, that already tells you something. So we have this line of the study guys, and we have, you know, what I'm learning from Donovan, and you have these sold out audiences, mm-hmm. this beautiful production, and yet, the times that touched me so much that I could tell you so many stories about were me being on stage and hearing an original line of Dickens' text go across the room and something would happen to everybody, people on stage, the audience, because it had been adapted in a more contemporary way, right? So it wasn't all the original text. Oh, interesting. And I remember clocking that, right? I remember thinking, this is beautiful. And also there's this other story going on in here that, that's more stripped bare, like the, like it's really the austere moments of the story that really interested me. 
And I had always been interested in classics mm-hmm. being looked at again from a fresh perspective, like we don't know them, like Our Town or something. You know, like these beautiful stories that maybe have a lot of history and folklore around them. What if we just went back to the beginning? So I would say this this long way around to answer your question is those were the real beginning moments and I never at that production I could go on just about that one experience it was so profound for me and it it was stayed deep in my heart and I every Christmas would always just be so sad if I wasn't in a production was but I would you know as most journeyman actors do and writers do you know I was working on the other projects sure. and it seemed like year after year I wasn't available to audition and it would bother me I had this little copy of Christmas Carol on my bookshelf and when I moved to New York which was part of my journey as an artist I would especially Christmas in New York which is similar now I know from being all over the world you know there's something special about that holiday season whatever not just Christmas Hanukkah all of it you know Kwanzaa but you know New York has a particular kind of beauty at that time of year and yeah it does and I wasn't in that production for so long, and I would long to be in it. And I started to formulate this idea by being on the subways, thinking, I really want to see a Christmas carol that looks like the New York subway. Like, yeah. how could you tell a Christmas carol that would touch a family from Ecuador equal to a family in Park Avenue? How could you, yeah. how could you reach a, a family in Hyde Park in London and in the Tower Hamlets? And you could... You could go down the middle in any country, in any city, and say, you know, because to me, that's what Christmas Carol is about. That's what Dickens is doing. But that's before all of those feelings and ideas came before I had ever really dug deeply into the marrow of who Dickens was and why he wrote Christmas Carol. This was just an idea that, you know, when you live in Harlem and you're going downtown for work, you know, you've got time on the subway. Yeah. I would daydream about this, and then I would talk myself out of it. And I'm like, man, there's so many Christmas carols. Like, what the world doesn't need is yet another adaptation. And there was a confluence of events and me talking myself out of it until I was working with Austin Pendleton on Chekhov. And oh, wow. I kept watching oh, him while oh. he was directing me, and I would watch him and think, Huh. Who could be a more extraordinary Scrooge than Austin Pendleton? At this time in his life, he fit into this idea I'd already had about how you could do this. And I, it just bothered me and bothered me. And it was really like this combination of an idea I'd had for a long time mm-hmm. and my love of Austin and my love of his work. And mm-hmm. also the time on the planet that he's had is perfect for what Scrooge is dealing with in the text. And that his Scrooge would be so different than... Mm-hmm. Which is not to say the other Scrooges around the world are amazing, but I felt that he would, if you were going to do an actor-driven New York version of Christmas Carol, who who better yeah. to be Scrooge to anchor it? And I could I, I could go on and on about oh, how I talked yeah. myself out of it and X Y Z, but I remember literally one night just on at Orange Coffee by Columbia University. <laughs> uh, sent Austin an email and said I was doing a production of the Scottish play and I, I was in my busted up jeans and I had my notebooks and my pencil and, I, and he was directing something oddly enough at the National Theatre in London and I emailed him and said listen if I do a reading of Christmas Carol in my living room nothing on it just to see if this way of doing it could work would you read Scrooge just so I can see if, if there's any any value in my taking a stab at this and he emailed back yes and from that moment till now has just been this whirlwind of a journey I mean I really truly we could have 10 episodes and we won't don't worry everybody but I could it would take a while to unpack but in a general sense well you know I'm somebody that would want to do those episodes so yeah, you have to you have to rein me in too you know it's a bit of, go, go ahead I'm sorry no, I think yeah. I would just say anybody who's ever yeah. created anything doesn't have to be in the arts even, a business, a, an anything. Anybody who's had an idea and brought it yeah. into the world yeah. knows that some of it is perspir- perspiration, some of it is preparation, and a lot of it is mysterious. And I would say that my work on that project has been very mysterious how it all came together. But this decision to go back to the original text word for word yeah. Not look at other adaptations or critical theory, which 
typically is a real value, but I was interested in seeing what would happen if we stripped it out and went back to the beginning and listened and let the story speak to us and not put a lot on it in terms of costumes and music and like actually only have music when it appears in the story, which is not often and really let it be quiet. And, and what would it be like if it were more urban, but not conceptual, just, yeah. It could be that could be now more vintagey, like your shabby chic Christmas carol. So it could be eighteen forty three London, but it could also be two thousand and eleven New York. Yeah. But you know that kind of thing. And I, I guess basically for for you for, folks in that troupe, it literally was two thousand eleven New York, right? Yeah, and because also, you were do, because you were doing it in, in that year as well, an example year, but also because. I, and I'm, I guess I'm speaking here. See, I've only seen your production once, right? But I've, I have experienced it. Mm-hmm. And the way I would describe your production, not to get uh, too um, technical, is that, and, and, and this is notwithstanding whatever your intent was, you actually accomplish in this show what what Bertolt Brecht's dream was for theater. Mm-hmm. His dream, his fantasy. Now, I, I leave aside whether he succeeded or not. That's a separate <laughs> question. He's a w- wonderful writer, but he did have this dream of a theater that was a direct encounter with with things in reality in life. And through this direct encounter, human consciousness would change by virtue of watching the play. Quite mm-hmm. literally, he was he wanted to do that. And they were, and I thought, well, your production. I don't think many productions do this, but actually I think you succeeded in, in whatever. Is that getting too far ahead? I'm sorry, but that's just my No, no. Impression. I mean, you know, that this is, you know, I appreciate that. That's, that's kind words. I mean, I, I was always fascinated by Brecht myself and I, one of the many, because again, as I said, both in graduate school and undergrad and professionally, I was fortunate that, you know, side by side that education I was in theater companies all of them dealing with the classics and all of them really steeped and rooted in serious dramaturgy, really, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So because of that, Brecht was a big, one of the big parts of my, I guess you could say coming up in the theater or coming up as a storyteller. And I was always fascinated by his mission around that. And without realizing it, I, I was that what is my has been was in the beginning my interest in telling it this way, which was to keep everyone on stage the entire time, mm-hmm. never mm-hmm. take scene breaks, never except for intermission, and also break the fourth wall and and really truly make it more of a production in the round, including the theater and the actors on stage, right? And also really, really dive deep into cultural diversity, but not to be clever or be cool, but because I was, I really just frankly wanted it to, like if we were telling Christmas Town on the subway, I want it to look like that. I, I want it to well, be. Well, you want it to be the subway, right? So, I want it yeah. to be, yeah, I mean, so. truly diverse. Not, not actually set in the subway, although possibly that would be cool, but yeah. but more than that, anybody can see themselves in this story, that yeah. there's a Bob Cratchit in Harlem, and there's a Scrooge on Wall Street, and there's, you know, like, in, we could go down the line, but that this is a universal story, and, yeah. and we can all relate. And, you know, I, I guess I started talking about it, because the real turning point for me, oddly enough, even though Austin, what an amazing thing, because he stayed with us we had nothing, nothing to give him, but he believed in it. And, you know, in the beginning, him being in it was the biggest thing we had going for us because the adaptation, I was still doing it. And let me just be interrupt myself again and say that this was not me by myself. I mean, I've been fortunate that John Greenleaf was a co-adapter and Jamie Bullins was, you know, in on all of this from the beginning and there were lots of artists and over time there have been artists all over the world. It hasn't only been like Laurie doing it all or anything. It's been a lot of amazing people and a lot of amazing artists and institutions that have hosted us, you know, cultural institutions. But in the beginning, you know, when Austin said yes, and we had no pressure because we're like, well, we'll do it in the living room, and if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It'll just be a cool experience. And we were still adapting, and the ink was wet. I think we were in stage one when the Abingdon Theater in New York called and said, we love Austin We're on our board, and we want a Christmas carol, and would you do it for a live-paying audience, wow. you know, in, in three weeks, two weeks? Huh. 
two and a half, three weeks. And, you know, <laughs> from that moment forward has been a kind of a nonstop train. But I believe all of that's happened to us because of going from the original work and thus digging even more deeply into research around Dickens. And I was, I, I remember this moment where we went to the drama bookstore in New York before we said yes to that. And we stacked up all these versions of Christmas Carol. I mean, literally took them off the shelves. We're looking through them all. I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just do Laird Williamson's, right? The one I was in. Yeah. And I emailed Laird and he said, he said, you could do mine, but I, you should make your own, mm. right? And I was like, oh my gosh. And <laughs> anyway, long story short, I, they were piled up all around me, but none of them that I, that were there that day at Drawn Books or anyway, were the original word for word novella adapted for the stage. They were all, you know, which is cool, but they were all like scene to scene, you know, normal play structure. And I really wanted that connected tissue of the narration in it. And, you know, I wanted to see if you could really stay as true to the novella as possible. So, you know, from that moment forward, digging deeper into the dramaturgy around Dickens, I wanted to read only his journals and his letters, only what he himself had to say about Christmas Carol hmm. and the actual text, nothing else wow. from anybody else, not even really famous Dickensian uh, scholars who I later did you know, study and some of them meet and become friends and colleagues with, but in the very beginning... I, you know, it's daunting in a way to take on a classic that everybody knows and loves. And it can also feel audacious to say, well, I've got this way I'm going to tell it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, to me anyway, that was what I grappled with for those 10 years of like, you know, really like, what else can you, there's so many adaptations. But in my own journey, I was like, okay, as an artist, the way I'm going to do this is to, to not get overwhelmed by that and just have this experience with this text and seeing what Dickens has to say about this gem of his, you know, mm -hmm. that he loved very much, but only in first person. I only want to know what he had to say. No theories about it, no mm -hmm. folklore about it. And that is really the key. That, more than anything, I mean, all these elements combined. I mean, someone like Austin and all these things, but what really did it was that. And when I learned really where Christmas Carol comes from, when I really learned the events leading up to his writing it, what he was going through, you know, that the Christmas Carol is very much his glass menagerie, his memory book, that many of the characters were named after his family members, things I didn't even know when I had thought I had done my due diligence as an actor in Denver. You know, I when I really started to understand how personal it was for him, this story, and mm -hmm. that there was a, a nephew of his, much like Tiny Tim, and that you know, the Cratchits were really the Dickens family. They lived in Camden Town when they were, you know, in starting to fall into poverty. And that Dickens himself is very reminiscent of Scrooge. And all those locations in the Christmas Carol now, fast forward to 2019, I've been to those places. I've been to the schoolroom where Ghost had passed, you know, takes him when he's a little boy, Scrooge, when he's a little boy. I've been to all those places in the Christmas Carol now over time. Mm -hmm. And really, that's really the, the real turning point for me. And I remember after, to fast forward from 2011 from the reading and then as mm -hmm. we started on stage, at one point I got to go to London and I wrote myself this note I left on my desk in New York that said, follow Dickens wherever this takes you. And I left it there. And on that trip in particular, I became close with many of the Dickens family members, all of whom were brilliant. Lucinda Dickens Poxley and Gerald Dickens and the Dickens Museum and all of these places that had been dreams of mine that I would ever connect with just about my love of Dickens and the story ended up over time becoming dear friends and colleagues. And we did the, our show at the Dickens Museum immersively mm -hmm. in 2014 and did some yeah, other venues in London. And, you know, so all of this is to say that I really believe that happened because of going from the original text and the spirit mm -hmm. of his beautiful work. It's all Dickens really, but mainly yeah. getting out of the way and listening but back to the beginning, and I'll take a breath. And That's a, that everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. 
I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. But I just want to say, mm -hmm. this experience, and you alluded to this in the beginning, of this being a universal story. I can tell you firsthand, boots on the ground, that I have talked about this story in Charles Dickens with someone homeless in a difficult section of London on an iceberg in Iceland, three gentlemen from Afghanistan in a coffee shop who don't celebrate Christmas, who love Dickens, an Egyptian yep. cab driver, yep. a man from Togo, Africa. I could go on yep. and on yep. about there's nowhere. I well, really that, that, there's that. there's evidence there, folks. I'm always I'm forever having. <laughs> I don't know who I'm arguing with more. I, I think I don't know who I, do I argue more with fundamentalist Christians that want to restrict Christmas or atheists who think Christmas is offensive. I'm always yeah. arguing. What I'm saying is I don't know who who I have more problems with equal. I guess, but I'm always <laughs> I'm always you know what I mean. I'm always running to people that want to make Christmas this thing that that that, that excludes people for some reason <laughs> or another. And here you are meeting people in Afghanistan that love Christmas Carol and, and deep, right? And I well, mean, continue. You know, That's just fascinating to me. Oh yeah, this me. this is, the, and I want to say, you know, like there are so many beautiful productions of Christmas Carol all over the world. In fact, the one running for the first time in a long time, there's one running on Broadway this year oh, yeah? that came that came from London. It's beautiful. I mean, they're all beautiful. It's not like, oh, ours is the only one. I will just say that I personally can tell you from a very profound experience. I mean, we started with nothing but the clothes on our back and some old books and a real love of telling the story in, in a different way or right. reinvestigating it anew. And our town has really informed this way of doing it. In fact, that's my question. Yeah, do you mind talking a little bit about that? Because I another thing that struck me was a deep Thornton Wilder influence on, on your production. Yeah. Do you mind discussing what that influence is or how the role that Wilder is clearly it's there. You mm -hmm. know, I just find that fascinating. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? I love them. Oh, yeah, sure. I love our I mean, town. Yeah. I love Thornton Wilder. I do too. What, and was you know, Thornton, what was Thornton Wilder's contribution to theater, would you say, in general, oh or what? What, what our town was a radical play, right? When it came out, right? I mean, it was mm -hmm. a play of great radicalism that then became main, it became mainstream and in, in later. It's interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, there's so much to say about Wilder and that play. Um, one of the reasons, and there's many, that it has been a touchstone for me with our production. But the very beginning, it was what happens when you look at a like. Let's take our town. If you say our town to a theater person. Sometimes they cringe, and then sometimes they'll cry because it's beautiful. But in general, it's done a lot, as is Christmas Carol, right? right? It's similar. done a lot, and you could say that it benefits from that, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Because it's done so much that people are like, oh, boy, here we go again, right? Christmas Carol, our town. I mean, they're beautiful stories, mm -hmm. right? But they often are done a lot. And that's you know, there's that, there's that great <laughs> documentary movie about making our town. Do you know right. what movie I'm talking about? Yes, yes. I want to do a shout yeah. out for that for that movie. Go see it. It's an older movie, but it's about um, it's about a, a, a production of our town in a, in a in a inner city, right? In a, in a, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. We'll try to be. we'll find it. We'll try to find it and link it below yeah. or add it it's a really later. Good film. Don't yeah. It, you know, long story short, it, it just always, well, it's one of my favorites, like Christmas Carol, but also there was something similar to me about what happens if you take a story that is so well known and done all the time and look at it like you don't know it at all. Because, because our town is so profound and beautiful and it's dealing with similar things. I mean, it's dealing with these eternal things, these eternal themes, and it's also dealing with memory and it's dealing with spirits, and it goes to this other place that's very metaphysical, as does Christmas Carol. Yeah. You know, the yeah. original title of A Christmas Carol is A Christmas Carol being a ghost story of Christmas. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, there's something metaphysical. Well, obviously, there's overtly metaphysical elements in Christmas Carol. There are right. ghosts, and there are spirits. Right. And, you know, but also in our town, you know, there's this thing of reaching across time. And, oh, yeah. 
this thing of waking up and being really in life when you haven't been or mm. the value of life or what would it what would it feel like if you could go back in time and have those precious moments a lot all of that is also in Christmas Carol and I, I just felt that it was it has been my touchstone all along our town and also Wilder I mean you could talk about that all day but you know yeah. in his day he was a radical I mean they they were rioting the theaters because of our town so we oh, think of it as this very sweet play about mm-hmm. blah blah you know this very sentimental story but actually in the time it was groundbreaking mm-hmm. it's still groundbreaking anyway but you know much like Christmas Carol I feel they are similar in the fact that you know we think we know them and we do and they've been a part of our lives of a conversation in art and in history and in, you know certainly in dramatic literature but actually if you look at them they're quite relevant and timely, and mm-hmm. if, if not, and probably now more than ever, really, yeah. Yeah. the times that we're in. So, uh, well, the, I don't the, think fig- the figure of the figure of Emily it, in our town coming back, I guess, from the other side, or, or, or communicating with the present, or her past. You know, seeing her family and, and watching mm-hmm. things, and then she gives us very. Um, oh yeah, it's almost like a monologue, and she talks about. Um, uh, the necessity of being in the present and seeing other people and paying attention. It's very beautiful. Mm-hmm. I can't, of course I can't do it. I'd have to literally read it, you know, to do it justice. I'm just, I'm just, um, but, oh, but anyhow, that mo- do you think that that moment structurally narratively has, has echoes with Scrooge's moment in, in the, Absolutely. In the yeah. when he wakes up at yeah. the end, you know, yeah. after goes to the future, yeah. um, visits him and he begs for another chance and, mm-hmm. You know, that whole section when he says, you know, happy as a schoolboy, you know, when he wakes up and he's just so in love with life and he's asking what day it is. And it's like he's suddenly living for the first time, you know, or for the first time in a long time. And that value of life. And that's the thing, like for us. And again, you know, some of this you can't, you can experience when you see something. But for us, because the narrators are a character in this. There are these mysterious creatures that kind of come in from all parts of the theater, and they could be spirits, actually, or they could be narrators. But because everybody plays multiple roles, there's this similar element as as there is in our town of the value of life and this this hope that if we all work together, and this includes the audience and the artists on stage, we can wake Scrooge up. Like, he has a chance. Mm-hmm. He, still has, he still has this chance, as Jacob Marley says, a chance and a hope. You know, and that's something Marley doesn't have, right? Marley mm-hmm. can't go back, but Scrooge still has a shot. He yeah. can still live this life, much like Emily. Emily can't go back, but right. she would if she could. Or she, you know, she thinks she wants to go back, you know. Well, it's, it's interesting because Emily, of course, is in many respects a very opposite character to Scrooge, right? I mean, when you say that Emily's somebody that's possessed of these extraordinary virtues, mm. um, but I don't think, I mean, rather, rather, I think she has those virtues earlier on in the play. Than it, so I don't think it's a case of someone, so it's, it's, it might be slightly different in that respect, but I don't know. But then, then again, the day she chooses to go back in that beautiful speech, the one that starts, oh, mama, look at me one minute, that, mm-hmm. that section, that, yep. you, would, you could say, though, that she's discovering in that moment just how precious it, precious it all was, and she didn't realize its full value. Because at the end of that speech, she says something like, oh, Earth, you're too wonderful mm-hmm. for anybody so to beautiful. realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live in it every minute? Mm-hmm. And then the stage manager says no, and then he pauses and he says, "The saints and poets, maybe they do something." They do, yeah. I love that 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 passage. Yeah, I'm happy and, for you to read that. But you know, there's there's actually hints. I, I'm not saying that Emily's a saint, obviously. Yeah. And they're actually earlier in the play, they're hints of some of her, like the way she treats George, for example. Um, sure. When they're courting the gossipiness, so there is so. What I'm saying is that our town is a very subtle play, and if you're really paying attention to it. It's not all. It's not as clear cut as you you would think if just seen it once. So it's interesting. Well, if people say it's a simple play, but it has it contains oh, it contains it's, multitudes, and I think Christmas it's, Carol is is that way too, right? Because people try to paint Scrooge as the villain or the bad guy, yeah. or the heavy, 
but you have a whole talk about your. Uh, yeah. And I don't see, I could, I see it a whole other. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only one, but yeah. I know that my viewpoint on screen is not that. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting because this is one of the reasons I was so excited for Austin to play Scrooge yeah. because I know his work so well as a, an actor, as a director, as a writer. And I knew he has this boyishness about him, this sort of sweetness. No. Yeah. That goes side by side the side of his worldliness, and I that just is felt I felt in my heart it was more an intuition than logic that he would come to the character of Scrooge without having anything on it. That he would be willing to just get in there and let it, it let it take him someplace, which he absolutely does. Mm -hmm. I I believe, and now fast forward over time, I've had the privilege of really spending amazing quality time with someone like Professor Michael Slater in London wow, and wow. again Lucinda Dickens Hawksley yeah, in the yeah. Dickens Museum and Dickens Papers and the Morgan Library and all this amazing journey I've been on Declan Kiley of the Morgan Library when he was there and you know um, the New York Public Library and all their private collections of Dickens materials and I could I'm only trotting all that out to say well first of all that's miraculous where a story can take you but also because you know, it's 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 really extraordinary what Dickens was aiming to do with Christmas Carol. I mean, he consciously was writing it to be the sledgehammer blow for the poor man's child. Mm -hmm. He had reason for writing it the way he did. And, you know, what he was bringing us all together under one roof to experience together. But more than anything, in the pages of Christmas Carol, what I know to be true, I would have known it if I had never met any of these amazing scholars, if I had never, I felt it in my heart that mm -hmm. Scrooge and Dickens are very much one and the same. Mm -hmm. And Scrooge actually has a huge heart. And he, you know, in the pages of Christmas Carol, there are so many passages about him as a boy. And immediately mm -hmm. when Ghost of Past takes him to the schoolroom when he was a boy, he starts to laugh and he starts to cry. And, he immediately, he wants to be taught. He says to every spirit, teach me. I had a lesson last night that is working on me. Show me. Teach me. He, he begs for his life at the end of this. Like, there's never, except for the very beginning before Marley comes and really breaks him down and, you know, gets to the, you know, gets to the heart of the heart. From that moment forward, he is... He wants to change in some way. It's in the text. It is, so I would yeah. actually say that Scrooge is the example of the lost children that Dickens is addressing. Yes, Tiny Tim is obvious, but less obvious is Scrooge. Mm -hmm. Scrooge is an example of a child that has fallen through the cracks. Scrooge is an example of a child that was affected by poverty. and As was Dickens. You know, yeah. Right. And and when you dig into Dickens' biography and you really get with the fact that he was in child he was in the workhouse in child labor because his parents were in the debtors' prison. When you when you really start to understand just how personal Christmas Carol is for him and the the state he was in when he wrote it and the events leading up to it, you realize that Dickens and Scrooge, you know, they're really there are some really um, I believe anyway that the lines are blurred and that the ghost in Christmas Carol is very much the, the child of Dickens himself. And, you know, that's really, that's, there's so many things in Christmas Carol to explore, but certainly one of them is this lost boy that we go back and get in Scrooge. So, well, that, that certainly connects with Christmas because a, a child is born is the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. You know that's in the that's in the New Testament, Testament Christmas story, and that makes me think. You know what flashed on my mind? Um, Flaubert of all people, all people. Mm -hmm. when he was asked about Madame Bovary, he says, "He says, say moi. That's that character is me. This woman mm -hmm. in the novel. He's a man. She's a woman. Very different. Led. So on the surface, you think they live utterly, totally different lives, but he's saying this novel is about me. Isn't that interesting? So interesting. And, you know, it's interesting um, with Dickens in The Christmas Carol, when you get into the Tiny Tim, you know, when he's being shown what's going to happen to Tiny Tim if things mm -hmm. don't change, primarily if he doesn't change his way of being with Bob Cratchit and his way of treating him and his family and what he pays mm -hmm. them and all of it. You know, and obviously we there have been a series of events that have led up to this moment, but actually there is a line um, from the Bible in that section when Tiny Tim 
when we're seeing what's going to happen with his passing, mm-hmm. you know, Peter Cratchit is reading, actually, there's an actual quote. <clears throat> and, you know, the thing about Christmas Carol is somebody said this to me once, because we, over time, changed our name to Everyone's Carol. At the beginning, it was a New York Carol, Everyone's Carol. And then when we did it in London, it was a London Carol, Everyone's okay. Carol, or any country. And then over time, it became clear that the simple way to say it, get down to it was Everyone's Carol, right? Mm-hmm. But it, I remember someone, once we changed our name, saying, well, you could do this show any time of year. It doesn't have to be Christmas. And mm-hmm. someone invited us, actually, in another country to do a reading of it in the spring. And I thought, wow, wow I never even thought of that. But again... What was that production just, like, if I may ask? What was that? Uh, yeah, what was that? Uh, Oh, it's just, just, it was a reading in that case, like a concert reading, but it was so oh. fascinating because nobody cared what time of year it was. In fact, next year we've been invited to Denmark and originally they wanted us to come in March or April of this year, 2020, of the next year, 2020. And now we were going to move it to Christmas time next year. But originally uh, it would have been this March or April upcoming and that would have been fine because I think when you take the... I mean, Christmas is in it, and as it should be, but it is also reaching for something even more vast. I mean, as I said, Dickens is the great teacher in this, isn't he? When he ends his story on those profound words, that takes us someplace else. That Basically, we've had artists from different cultures who celebrate things other than Christmas. We've had audience members from every kind of religion and, you know, um, country and culture and it doesn't matter and when we do it we also have a festival in the lobby with bell ringers and hot chocolate and you know like a little holiday market which means that you know we always invite artists from different cultures to play different instruments or sing or Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. we also have a a dickens education program and i mentioned this to just say that i had a lot of experience now with this story in different cultures and also with artists both in our cast and people coming to be a part of that production both in the lobby on stage in the education unit or audience members who celebrate very different things from christmas Mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter it's so joyful because people are just gathering around the heart of this little story that basically says we're all in it together like these children in ignorance and want section Mm -hmm. of the story these are all our children meaning all of us scrooge is all our children right we are all in this together and that part of Dickens' spirit, which lives on, I mean, this, long after I'm not here, there'll be, Christmas Carol will go on. <laughs> yeah. and, it, yeah. and it, as it should, because there's eternal things, much like in our town, that he's touching, you know, he's touching something eternal about what it means, as your podcast is about, what it means to be human. Be human, yeah, that's right. But that's right. what I said when we started our podcast. I was one of my, one yeah. of my uh, lines. Laurie Jill... Strickland, I'm going to um, um, say, uh, unfortunately, even good things have to end, right? <laughs> Eventually. But what I'm going to say, first of all, is thank you for discussing this, because uh, I think it's very important. Um, not everybody, people may all know Christmas Carol, but not everybody maybe fully understands everything behind it or in it. But also I want to say that I wish you uh, many more productions Thank you. Of your vision of it, because I, I like it. And I want to thank you for coming on the show. And I'm going to uh, close out the show by playing some improvised music. Uh, inspired. Well, can I? Yes. I have a little gift for you. I didn't want to interrupt. Uh-huh. Um, I have a little gift for you uh, for having me on to talk about this. And I wondered if I could just read a tiny little quote from Christmas Carol that uh, it's very short. You can read whatever you want. Okay, they're yep. really short. Um, there's two little, Doesn't there's so many short, things I could but... read, but I wanted to surprise you. But I'm okay. so excited so. you're going to improv. And this is for everybody. And again, you know, when we decided to do this episode, I know we spoke at length about it being really just the holidays in general, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And um, one day, maybe next year, or, you know, when we go to Denmark, we'll have like a live reading where people can call in and read sections from the carol or some other work, you know, Um for our show, and when we do that, I'll get back to you and let you know. But um, yep. this is yep. from Fred's speech in the beginning, and this mm. is also something that really made me want to do it this way, or want to do it at all, really. And then I won't read the whole section, but anybody who knows Christmas Carol will know it, and if you don't, then I'll link it whenever we share this, and mm-hmm. uh, it's beautiful. Fred, nephew Fred, is saying to Scrooge, 
it's good to just told him to leave him alone. You know, like what good has Christmas ever done you? And he's, Fred says, there are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited. Mm-hmm. I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it has come around as a sacred time, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, Mm, I believe it has done me good, and it will do me good, and I say God bless it. And the other is just very briefly, there's there's so many things Scrooge says when he has a transformation, but one of my favorite ones is, He's basically they're saying how his transformation won't mean a lot to other people that they're making fun of him. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, and Scrooge says in his own consciousness, this is his own narration. And knowing that such as these people would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins and have the malady in less attractive forms. But his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. Mm-hmm. So this idea that it was enough for him, even if people made fun of him, even if they didn't believe he had really changed, that it didn't matter because he had woken up and he had taken that last chance he had at having a different life that was connected in the world with other people. No matter the loneliness and pain he had found, that he had found a way to connect not only with others but inside himself. And I always love that line, like his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. Mm. It's a quiet line. It's not the most swashbuckly line of all, but it, to me, is the most profound. So thank you for having me on and for letting me go on and on about my love of Dickens and the story. <laughs> well, I, it's been real joy. And that, that particular line, there's a lot I could say about that. Now, it doesn't surprise me you like it so much. Um, you talk about the heart laugh, laugh, laughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's just beautiful, the writing of that. Yeah, and any, any Dickens scholars listening, I mean, I skipped over lots of the important details, but, you know, there's so much to say about Dickens in that story. So thank you for having me on, for the oh, sure. honor of being on your show. I've enjoyed it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, play a little something unexpected now. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, try to, I'll also try to make it equally short. <laughs> I hope you can hear it. Thank you. 
Something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Yay! Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> Happy holidays. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you.